Okay, after we've done a good bit of uh, three-dimensional visualization with computing of volumes and so on, we're now coming to the computation of work. And uh, we will see in this presentation, for example, why I prefer to sli slice volumes horizontally in quite a few of the presentations that we had. And that is because a good bit of the work, in fact, all of the work that we're going to do in the examples uh, for a mass being moved to the International Space Station to an anchor chain being lifted to a tank being emptied. All that work is being done against gravity, which means we have a vertical lift and we will see that that will require us to slice things horizontally. Let's take a look at the physical definition of work and then go from there. Uh, the definition of work is always force times distance. It's always that you are applying a force while moving an object across a certain distance. However, just like for velocity, there are some provisos because the formula work equals force times distance only applies when the force is constant and parallel to the distance. Now, uh, angles between the force and the distance will be considered in multivariable calculus. We don't have vectors yet, or at least we choose not to work with vectors yet. They wouldn't be that hard to introduce. Um, and so what we have to do is when the force is not constant, we will use the standard approach that we have seen before, which is that we partition the process into small enough pieces so that all the relevant quantities, the force as well as the distance, can be considered constant. And then we will just go ahead and uh, work that out. All right, so we will also set things up with differentials now that we've talked a little bit about differentials. So for uh, at least for the chain and the tank, I will at the end of the presentation also show you how to set up the integral with differentials. Uh, that approach is, is sometimes seen in applied texts, especially in physics texts. And historically, it really would be the way that giants of uh, mathematics and science, such as Leibniz and Euler, would have done it because they lived all their lives before the definition of the limit really became the powerhouse that underlies uh, modern, uh, modern calculus now. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. And we want to compute the minimum amount of work that is required to move a payload of mass one kilogram from the surface of the Earth to the International Space Station. So, uh, well, that would mean we have to go from somewhere down here, if you can still see the cursor, somewhere down here, to the International Space Station. This is a very nice NASA image. They have a very nice policy regarding using the imagery, except that uh, as the images are being used, I should uh, always put in the disclaimer that although this is a NASA picture, I am using it uh, in accordance with their uh, very generous policy, but that should not be considered an endorsement. So endorsement by NASA is neither claimed nor implied for this presentation. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at that. Well, the work would be the uh, force times the distance, but if we're looking at a mass at a height rk above the center of the Earth, then the force changes because as you move away from the surface of the Earth, the gravitational attraction from the Earth to the mass gets weaker. And so that means the, f the gravitational force that an object um, experiences on the surface of the Earth will be smaller than an object would experience as it is several radii out uh, from the center of the Earth. And so the idea for the computation is that we consider our mass and we're looking at moving that mass a short distance delta r farther away from the center of the Earth, and at that place rk, the gravitational force we have to overcome is f of rk. Then we sum over all the little delta r's from the start to the end, and when we take the limit over the delta r's going to zero, or using infinitely many partitions, as we have seen in uh, Riemann sums, we get that the work, the total work, should be this sum, and that is, of course, the integral of the, over the force along the distance that we are traveling. So that would mean 
we would integrate from our starting point, which is the radius of the Earth, to the radius of the orbit of the International Space Station. We would integrate the gravitational force, which by Newton's law is the gravitational constant times the mass that we move, times the mass of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, divided by the distance between the two centers, and then we are moving dr, so if you were to do this with differentials, you would say we're moving a differential distance dr against this gravitational force, and we are summing all those little, um, uh, little quantities of work from the radius of the Earth to the radius of the International Space Station. And, well, we can integrate that, of course, because g, lowercase m, and capital M are just constants. The antiderivative of 1 over r squared is negative 1 over r, which is not that hard. And then we just take this in the boundaries from the radius of the Earth to the radius of the International Space Station. The rest is numbers. Unfortunately, the numbers are ugly, but that, help, uh, that cannot be helped if we're looking at a real problem, and this certainly is a real problem. Okay, so what are the numbers? The gravitational constant, okay, first the negative sign is right here. The gravitational constant is 6.6720 times 10 to the negative 11, and the, new, the unit is Newton times square meters divided by square kilograms. The mass that we want to move, well, that's one kilogram, so that's right here. The mass of the Earth, I looked that up, that's about 5.9763 times 10 to the 24 kilogram. And, uh, well, then we have... 1 over the radius of the orbit of the International Space Station minus 1 over the radius of the Earth. I took a mean radius of the Earth, which, was, which gave me the 1 over 6,371 kilometers. And the International Space Station is around 350 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, right? That's about what we're getting here. And so I used a radius for its orbit of 6,725 kilometers kilometers. The thing to consider here is whenever you look at a mass that starts on the surface of the Earth, it doesn't start at zero, it starts at whatever the radius of the Earth is when you use Newton's gravitational law. When you use mgh, which probably would give a very similar result here if you, um, if you work with potential energy, uh, then you could use h equals zero and h equals a couple 350 some kilometers, but uh, I'm using Newton's law here also to prepare us for ultimately computing the escape velocity. Okay, now these numbers, of course, when you work them out, you work them out with a calculator. That is not something where I would want to do any kind of mental arithmetic with them. The only sanity check that we could do here and that physicists typically uh, recommend is that you want to make sure that the units are correct. Well, the unit for work is the Newton meter. So that would be a Newton meter, so we would need to get rid of the square here and of the kilograms. Well, let's see. Here's a kilogram and here's a kilogram, giving us kilogram squared in the numerator, canceling with the kilogram squared in the denominator, so that's good. And the unit of this part in the back here is one over kilometer, which can be turned into 1 over meter. It's just another factor 1,000 that we have to stick in there. And so that means one of the meters cancel, and that means that the unit of this big old ugly number really is Newton meters. And the result actually is that this is 3.2945 times 10 to the 6 Newton meters, or joules, I think. And if we want to turn that into a unit uh, that is a little bit more common, we would realize that a Newton meter is the same as a watt second, and we keep the same number. And if I want to do that, well, watt seconds I can turn into watt hours, and uh, that would just mean that I, uh, let's see, I multiply and divide by 3,600. The multiplication of the seconds with 3,600 turns it into hours, and so we divide the whole thing the number by 3,600, and that gives us about 915.1 watt-hours. And that is a surprisingly small number, because after all, we all know uh, a 100 watt light bulb and basically the energy to move a mass of one kilogram 
from the surface of the Earth to the International Space Station is the same amount of energy that is needed to let a 100 watt light bulb burn for a little bit more than nine hours. Now that, that doesn't feel right because of course we know that in order to move masses, payloads to orbit, you need booster rockets, you need huge amounts of energy and that's where the formulation comes back. We have just computed the minimum amount of work that is needed to move that payload up. So if there was a way to set up an elevator where we just pull the mass up and invest very little energy into the lifting mechanism, then really it would be this little energy. So in principle, um, it could be possible to move to orbit um, very cheaply if only we had the right kind of lifting mechanism. And of course, that is what people are working on. Uh, there is a, currently a space elevator is science fiction because uh, the materials just aren't strong enough for something like that. But if there ever was a breakthrough in materials or in booster mechanisms, all of a sudden achieving orbit could become a whole lot cheaper than it is now. Uh, so if you're in engineering and if you like space exploration and things like that, hey, that may be something that you could devote your life towards because it, it is a fascinating and, and certainly, at least in my opinion, eventually beneficial topic for all of us. Okay, back to Earth, literally. And I want us to look at an anchor chain and I want us to look at an anchor chain that is 50 meters long and so that one meter of the chain has a mass of 20 kilograms. So this is a substantial chain and I'm saying that the anchor itself has a mass of 400 kilogram. Now I made those numbers up but I looked at what chains weigh that, that are used to moor yachts and what the anchors weigh and then I just scaled it up so this would be something that would hang off a capital ship of something that is just titanic size or so. And the question then is if the anchor chain is paid out straight down, so if the anchor is hanging straight down into the water, which it is when the chain is being hauled in, for example, how much work do you need to pull up the anchor? I mean, those things are attached to uh, significant sized motors and there is quite a bit of work that needs to be done to haul those anchors up from the ground as the ship gets gets back on its journey again. So, well, how do we do that? First step, let's visualize it. Chain, anchor, and that really is the visualization. We're going to come back to that and this is one of the reasons why I like this problem because we always say we want to visualize but it turns out that a very simple visualization is actually all that we need. Now I can also draw a nicer picture where I can maybe make an anchor look a little bit nicer and say that okay the, the chain is attached to a ship which, which has cabins and more cabins and chimneys and a horn that goes toot or something like that. Um, but ultimately for our modeling really only the chain and the anchor as a point mass will matter. So how do we work this out? Well first of all let's look at what is required to pull up the anchor. Well, the work to pull up the anchor is just the force times the distance. And because we're not hauling over significant distances above the, um, um, on, over the surf, away from the surface of the Earth, we can assume that the force is constant, just mass times gravitational acceleration. And we multiply that with the distance. And so that would be 400 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 50 meters. And if we work that out, let's see, well, uh, I just worked it out directly with a calculator. It turns out to be 196,000 Newton meters. Let's see, the zeros here give us the thousand. Five times four is 20, and 20 times 9.8 is 196. So yeah, that does work out. Now, if you look at it like this, you could say that that ought to be all the work. So what's the point in integration? Well. It's not all because we must pull up the chain too. And here's where it gets interesting because the links that are at the bottom of the chain have to travel a long distance, the links in the middle have to travel a shorter distance, and the links at the top have to travel almost no distance. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we forget about the ship and all the other fancy stuff because really we only have a chain that hangs straight down, point mass at the end. We could even forget about the point mass. 
And what we have then is we have to look at a link or a, a really short segment. That segment is supposed to have uh, length delta h for our investigation. And a segment of length delta h, if we say that h equals 0 is where the, ch where the chain is being hauled in, then this, this link of length delta h, or this differential, uh, this short segment of length delta h, would have to travel a distance h upwards. Okay, so say that the point from which the chain is paid out is at height 0, then the segment at height h must travel a distance of negative h upwards. You may want to wonder why that's negative, but uh, that is negative because h is negative, right? If my 0 is here and then the rest is below sea level or uh, below river level, if I don't think a boat that big gets into a river, um, so below sea level, well then h is negative and yet the distance that we're talking about is supposed to be a positive number, so we would work at, with negative h there. If the length of the segment is delta h, which is what we assumed, then its mass is, of course, the linear mass density, 20 kilograms per meter times however many meters or fractions of meters we have here. And that means that the required force to lift this little mass uh, of length delta h is delta f being uh, gravitational acceleration times the mass of that short piece of length delta h. So 9.8 meters per second squared times 20 kilograms per meter times delta h. And now if we want to have the whole work, of course, we have to add up all the distances that a mass at height h uh, has to travel times the force that is required to move that mass at height h. And because the force contains the delta, we're actually having s delta f. That is not a problem. And uh, well, what do we get? We get that we need to have the limit as delta h goes to 0 of the sum of the distance that the thing travels, which is uh, negative h, times the force that is being done, which is the 9.8 meters per second squared times 20 kilograms per meter times delta h. And that is something that as delta h goes to 0, as the, uh, dif uh, as the length of these little uh, segments shrinks to 0, we end up with an integral of negative h times and 20 times 9.8 is 196. And then here the meters cancel, so we end up with kilograms per second squared. Uh, integral against dh and we integrate from where we have to start, which is at negative 50 meters, because the chain is 50 meters long, totally paid out, all the way to 0 meters, which is where the chain ends. So I guess 0 meters is not, is not sea level, it's where the chain enters the ship. Well, that so be it, we can scale that any way we want to. Quick sanity check regarding units. h carries the unit of meters, dh carries the unit of meters. So this turns out to be a kilogram per meters times meter per second squared times meter, which is Newton meters, so all that works out. And so what do we get? Well, the antiderivative of h is 1 half h squared. We keep the negative sign. We keep the 196 kilogram per second squared. And then we just plug that in. Well, at the upper bound, we get 0. At the lower bound, we get negative 50 meters. And so that means we get the negative, negative, right? We have the negative from up here. We keep the numbers, we keep the 1 half, and then we have 0 minus 2,500 minus negative 50 quantity squared. So minus 2,500 times meters squared. And if we work that out, well, we end up with, let's see, 196 divided by 2 is about 100, so it should be around 250,000 here, and it ends up being 245,000 Newton meters. And the total amount of work is 196,000 Newton meters from lifting the anchor, plus 245,000 Newton meters for the chain, being a total of 441,000 Newton meters. Now that is a significant amount of work, certainly, and what we can also see is that lifting the chain actually takes more work than lifting the anchor, because in this, again, repeat, uh, fictitious example, the chain is very substantial. But if you ever are in a harbor and have the chance to look at a capital ship and at the anchor chains that those things have, those things are quite hefty. And so I'm not even sure if maybe this 
old is an underestimate. All right, now I have this this problem. Okay, let me just say that right here. At this stage, this problem is solved, and we've solved it with Riemann sums. We've solved it with finite deltas. However, as we have seen in the volume presentation, differentials are really nice to speed up certain computations because it allows us to sidestep the limits and the finite deltas. So what I would like to do at the end of this problem is to go through the derivation of the work that is required to lift up the chain one more time and I'd like to show it to you how it's done with differentials. Let's get to that. Um, so basically when you work with differentials you're not talking about a finite length delta h, you're talking about a differential length dh. And what we then know is when we set up the work for the chain with differentials, then the work is the integral, because we're summing over all the differentials from negative 50 meters to 0 meters, of the distance that this differential piece of length dh has to travel, uh, which is h or negative h, times the force that is required in a differential element only requires a differential amount of force, so we integrate df, and then we certainly have to figure out what df is. Well, okay, we keep the integral, we keep the negative h, and df was, of course, the mass, which is the 20 kilograms per meter times the differential length times the gravitational acceleration, and this now is exactly the same integral as what we had before, and so that integral works out the same way as before, 20 times 9.8 is 196, we end up with the negative 196 kilogram per second squared times one half h squared. We end up with the same thing for the number. We end up with the same 245,000 Newton meters. However, what we can see is that the initial setup was a bit quicker. And so if you are more comfortable with differentials, then there is a good bit to be said for setting things up with differentials right away. Okay, we've got one more, and that is where we're talking about a tank, and that's an oil tank, not a tank that is being used in war, and uh, at least for this example. And so we're talking about a full spherical oil tank of radius r, and uh, we want to empty that tank by pumping out the oil through the top of the sphere. And we want to know how much work is needed to empty the tank this way. So what's that look like? Well, here's a cross-section of the tank, and we put a coordinate system in there, x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and this tank has radius r. So if we're looking at a... And, and so now, yes, yeah, so now how do we empty this oil out? Well, same thing as for the anchor chain. Basically, if we have a slice of the oil at height y, then that slice will have to travel all the way from here to r, so that would have to travel a distance of r minus y, um, and so that means that oil that is farther down in the tank will require more work to be pumped out per molecule or whatever you want to call it um, than oil that is higher up in the tank, right? I mean, the, the first little bit of oil that is right up top here that almost spills out, that you can just scoop that out, there's negligible amount of work to be done, whereas down here you really have to lift the oil out. So that means because molecules at the same height will require the same amount of work to be lifted through the top, we really have to talk about slices here. And, and that, of course, is very strange from an everyday point of view because you can't slice oil. What you could think about is you could super cool this stuff until it solidifies and then basically slice the frozen layers and lift those out if you want to visualize it like that. But in the end, this is one of those where you just have to uh, suspend your disbelief to make the model work. Um, yes, you would lift this out slice by slice. You could say that you've got basically a, a shop vac or something up top here, and as that shop vac always stays right at the surface of the oil, all that shop vac sucks out is, of course, the top layer. And so that would be another way to say where we're quote unquote slicing the oil. Okay, so let's look at a representative slice and remember, or if you want to go back to it, you can see that this is very similar to the picture that we had when we computed the volume of a sphere or so. So we have these slices. These slices are of height delta y. They are of uh, radius. Remember that the 
horizontal cross section is a circle, the radius would be square root r squared minus y squared, because after all, this circle here, this vertical cross section, has equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Solving for x gives us the square root r squared minus y squared. That means that the base area of this slice is pi times r squared minus y squared. And with that, we can figure out the volume of these slices. And the slice, if it's sufficiently thin, has to travel a distance of r minus y to be lifted from its current position to the top so it can be uh, spilled over the top or pumped over the top into uh, presumably the heating ducts or if this tank has to be just evacuated to be replaced into a waiting tanker. Okay, so the small amount of work that needs to be done, this delta f that needs to be done to lift a slice at height y, uh, well, would that, what would that be? That would be the gravitational acceleration that this slice experiences times the mass of the slice, which is like uh, a small amount delta m. And, well, that would be gravitational acceleration times density of the oil, rho, times delta v, times this small uh, amount of volume here. And that would be, well, gravity times density. And the volume is base times height, pi times r squared minus y squared times the height, which is delta y, because these things are cylindrical slices. And now for the work, we have to add that up. So we have to look at the distance that the slice at height y has to travel times the amount of work that is required to lift that slice. We have to add that up and we need to let the uh, thickness of these slices go to zero to make sure that the error that we make here, uh, because volumes that are at the top of the slice will have to be lifted slightly less than the stuff that's at the bottom of the slice, so we need to let the delta y go to zero, as we have always also let the n go to infinity in our uh, work with Riemann sums. And so when we do that, then we, uh, first of all, just plug things in. S of y is r minus y, right? That's right here. Delta f we've just computed here, that's this one. And as we take the limit, that uh, is an integral. So we have an integral from the start to the end. Well, we start at negative r, we end at r, in if we actually could lift things out from the bottom to the top. But this way will give us a positive integral, so that that works out too. We have the distance, we've got the work, and the delta y, of course, again, turned into the dy, the integration variable there. And so uh, if I were to work that out with differentials before we even work out the integral, we, work, we set the whole thing up with differentials. Well, the differential amount of force that is required to lift a slice of thickness dy would be gravitational acceleration times the differential mass, which is gravitational acceleration times uh, density times differential volume, and that would be gravity times volume times uh, gravity times density times differential volume, which is base times the differential height dy. So the setup, if we were to set up the integral with differentials, sidesteps the delta, sidesteps the limits, and gives us directly that the work is the continuous sum from negative r to r of distance traveled times gravity times density times base times the differential thickness dy. And as we have also talked about in other presentations, we've just seen two ways to set up the integral. And from our current point of view, even though the computation still has to be done and some computations can and will be challenging, at this point, from the point of view of the new stuff, at this point, the problem is done. We have set up the integral. Everything else, we already know how to do. We still have to do it, and of course there are parameters in here which will make the whole thing a little bit rougher, but we'll work it out. So, uh, what do we have? We have that the integral is what we had derived twice now, and what can we see here? Well, g rho and pi are constants, so we can take that out, and other than that, we just have to multiply out the parentheses to compute the integral. So we get g rho pi integral negative r to r, r squared minus y squared times r minus y, and now we multiply that out. So we keep g rho pi, integral negative r to r, r squared times i, r is r cubed. Then we have 
negative y squared times y is negative r y squared. r squared times negative y is negative r squared y. Negative y squared times negative y is y cubed. Uh, dy is still there, and now we just integrate that. Well, that shouldn't be too hard. We just have to remember that we integrate with respect to y, right? So g rho pi stays with us. We make a big set of parentheses. Integral of r cubed with respect to y is just r cubed y, because r is a constant. Negative r y squared, if we integrate that, we get negative one third r y cubed. Um, the integral of y squared is of y is one half y squared. We keep the negative, we keep the r squared. And the integral of y cubed with respect to y is one fourth y to the fourth. Then we plug in the numbers, well, or the uh, the radius, okay, so we keep the g rho pi, plug in r, plugging in r gives us r to the fourth, plugging in r gives us negative one third r to the fourth, plugging in r gives us negative one half r to the fourth, plugging in r gives us one fourth r to the fourth minus, now we do the same thing, plugging in negative r gives us negative r to the fourth, plugging in negative r gives us minus minus gives us plus one third r to the fourth, plugging in negative r gives us still negative one half r to the fourth because the square cancels the negative sign and plugging in negative r here gives us plus one fourth r to the fourth. And if we work that out, we see that this one, because of this negative sign, cancels with this one. And this one here, because of this negative sign, cancels with this one over here. Whereas the other ones actually double up, right? Minus minus gives us plus r to the fourth, and minus plus gives us a minus one third r to the fourth. So what do we get here? We get r to the fourth minus one third r to the fourth. Well, that is two thirds r to the fourth, and if we then basically double that, we get four thirds r to the fourth. And so now let's see that. Yeah, and that's exactly what we get: four thirds g rho pi r to the fourth, and uh, that is already the answer to the whole thing. And so what can we see here? Why is that a little bit familiar maybe? We know that the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, which means that the mass of oil in the total sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed rho. And so 4 thirds pi r cubed times g, that would be the force that is required to, to lift the whole sphere. And what's left in all of this is that from the r cubed, we've got one r left. So basically, the amount of work that is required to pump out the tank completely is the same amount of work that would be needed to lift the whole tank one radius up. And now remember, radius is not diameter, so this is the same amount of work as if we would lift all of the oil half the distance uh, that the bottom layer goes up. Okay, uh, that already is it. This last remark about what this could be, that's just an interpretation. That's one of those need to know things, not a need to know thing. And if that doesn't make sense, well, um, that's, that's not a problem. The main thing is that we can do the setups. And so what is left for you now is potentially one of the most challenging sets of homeworks as we're doing application of integration because now we have to do physics as well as geometry in visualizations of various kinds of work where we lift stuff, where we slice things horizontally. But it is something that is very good presence, uh, very good practice, very good practice in setting up things with differentials or with Riemann sums. Um, I'll let you do that. And I'll see you in the next one.